use that. Okay. So, um, and and I may I apologize to some of the presenters if if we start hearing some background noise in the middle of what they're presenting, um, I will interrupt and um, ask people again to to put their phones on mute. Um, uh, in terms of um, questions, uh, if you have a question while someone is presenting um, that you need to ask in order to understand the slide, um, feel free, you know, to jump in and ask it immediately. If if you understand something on the slide, the chances are that others um, don't understand it either. So we uh, that kind of thing be cleared right away. Um, but if you have, you know, any other type of question, a general question, um, we ask that you please wait for the question and answer period at the end of the webinar. Uh, in terms of, uh, be, because there are quite a lot of participants um, expected at this webinar, um, the way that we're going to handle questions is, if you all look at the bottom, I think it's at the bottom right-hand corner of your screen, um, there's a little button that has a hand on it. Um, if you click on that button, um, I get on my screen, my screen. A, name, um, a little hand that shows me that you have a question, and I'll wait for an appropriate time during the webinar um, to to be able, you know, to allow you to interject your question. If you all want to, there we go. Gus just tried his hand. If you want to try that little hand, um, it works. I see people trying it out. Um, go right okay well, that's how um because otherwise it you know with with everybody kind of starting to talk when there are this many people on the conference line um it can get a little bit confusing so um if you have a question please click on that, that little button um and i'll find i'll find a chance um to get you in there and, and ask your question so um Let's get started. Um, first, I want to take a minute to give an overview of EPA's Green Shield Partnership. Um, Green Shield is a partnership between EPA, supermarkets, and other supermarket industry stakeholders. Um, Green mission is to reduce refrigerant emissions from supermarkets and, of course, decrease their impact on the ozone layer and on climate change. And the um, way that we go about doing that is concentrate mainly on trying to um, lower refrigerant charge sizes, eliminating refrigerant leaks, and um, working with the industry to adopt green refrigeration technology strategies and practices. And we are mission with three main green chill programs. We have Green Chill Corporate Emissions Reduction Program, um, we have Store Certification Program, and we have the Advanced Refrigeration Program. And, um, there you have our our website, which you know feel free um, to uh, check that out. I think there's a lot of good information on there. Uh, in terms of how chemical manufacturers fit into the Green Chill Partnership, um, first and most obviously, um, supermarkets refrigerant choice or everyone's refrigerant choice um, impacts the ozone layer and climate change. Um, Green Chill partners have committed, um, when they join Green Chill, to no R22 use in new construction and remodels, um, which includes expansions um, since 2007. So uh, partners are all using HCC substitute chemicals. Plus, we know that supermarkets are trying to reduce their dependence on R22 by retrofitting um, their equipment to use HFCs. So in this context, um, uh, we here at Angel feel that it's important to stress, um, you know, R22 retrofits um, to us, it, they're an environmental end in and of themselves. It's not our goal to have supermarkets, you know, emit a thousand pounds of an HFC instead of a thousand pounds of R22, right? That doesn't get us anywhere environmentally. Um, 22 retrofits aren't required by EPA regulations, um, and and they're not one of Green Chill's main priorities. Um, for, um, we we know that um, many many supermarkets out there are doing retrofits, so we want to be sure 
ensure um, that they're being done according to the best environmental practices available. So regardless of the refrigerant um, that is being used in supermarket commercial refrigeration, um, for green chill, leak tightness is the priority. Um, so uh, our message about retrofits is that you, have, you should be prioritizing leak tightness when retrofitting from R22 to other refrigerants. And Greenshill has a retrofit best practices guideline. Um, the link is there. And we have a fact sheet about prioritizing leak tightness during R22 retrofits. And link to that is there also. So with that in mind, um, I was asked to put together a webinar on commercial refrigerants as part of Greenshill's monthly webinar plan. Um, that monthly webinar plan, by the way, is available on Greenshill's website um, under the, t the session on um, events and webinars. Um, we also post all of our webinars on Greenshill's LinkedIn group. And if you want to uh, join that LinkedIn group, go to Greenshill's homepage to the new box, and um, the instructions on how to join are there. So the webinar we decided on related to commercial refrigerants is called um, Commercial Refrigerants, Where Are We Headed? Uh, supermarkets have to choose between the many available refrigerants for various applications. Um, and I know through conversations with partners and others in the industry, um, environmental concerns are you know, more and more at top of mind when supermarkets are making these choices. In terms of 2010 and beyond, um, the environmental considerations related to refrigerants seem to be um, centered around uh, two main considerations. One is the R22 phase out, and the other one is global warming concerns. Um, now, just a note: uh, to, although today's webinar focuses on on what we kind of call, you know, chemical refrigerants, um, there. There is a range of natural refrigerant options available that um, also, you know, they don't harm the ozone layer and they have very low global warming potentials. Um, available especially for newly constructed stores. Um, and these refrigerants, they're not going to be covered in this webinar, but we do have webinars scheduled for later on in the year uh, that focus on natural refrigerants. So keep natural refrigerants in mind while we're going through this webinar, and, and certainly um, keep an eye out for the webinars that focus um, on, on, that, on the topic of natural refrigerants. Um, in terms of the agenda, uh, uh, see, we're going to um, I'm gonna hand things over. Um, all right, so it, in terms of the agenda, um, it's as follows. Um, you see that we're scheduled for Q&A after the presenters are finished, and um, we can continue that Q&A up to 4.30 if there are enough questions. Um, so I'm going to uh, hand over the webinar to our presenters today. Um, the first two presenters are actually my colleagues here at the EPA, Jeremy Arling and Dave Godwin. And most of the presenters are representatives from um, Green Chill's chemical manufacturing partners. So, um, and that is, presenters are Ron Fogel from Honeywell, Stephen Sletzer from Arkema, Nick Strickland from DuPont, Scott Corper from Mexichem Floor, and David Callender from iCore. I'm going to hand over the webinar um, to our presenters today. And um, the first is uh, Jeremy, who is Jeremy Arling from EPA, who is going to tell us a little bit more about that first environmental concern. Go ahead, Jeremy. Okay, thanks, Keely. Uh, I'm Jeremy Arling. I'm one of the EPA employees here in the Stratosphere Protection Division who worked on the phase out regulation that was published last December. Um, and I'll be talking briefly about the regulation that implements the Montreal Protocol phase out of HCFC 22, um, or R22 as well. Um, primarily, what I want to talk about is how the phase out affects availability of R22. Um, under Montreal Protocol, um, HC22 must be, or at least the way the EPA is implementing it, must be uh, completely phased out in 2020. So, the 2010 step, 
uh, we were the first time that EPA allocated a, a amount of R22. And this amount will continue to decline, um, annual step down until um, 2010 through 2015, and then be completely eliminated in 2020. Um, that is new production and import. Um, similarly, you can have it from there. Can I just? Can I, um, we're getting some background noise from from somebody in the background. Can can I get anybody who's not a presenter to put the phone on mute? Thanks a lot. Sorry, Jeremy. Go ahead. Oh, no problem. Sorry about that. So um, as I was saying, in 2010 through 2015, EPA is allocating a certain limited amount of HCFC 22. And come 2020, EPA will not be allocating any uh, HCFC 22. So what that means is that increased recovery and reclamation or recycling will be necessary to meet the demand of existing refrigeration and air conditioning equipment. Um, what the regulations also do that were passed or that we had promulgated back in last year was that we said existing equipment can continue to be serviced using R22. Um, we are not mandating the retrofit or replacement of existing R22 equipment to HFC alternatives, and this is something that Keeley touched upon in one of her introductory slides. If you have existing equipment, you can continue to service that existing equipment. Um, however, uh, do not consider the expansion of an existing uh, equipment to be considered servicing. Um, that would be more like the creation of a new system. Uh, under the regulations cannot be manufactured using R22, and I should, that also includes blends containing R22 or blends containing 142B. The three of those are treated similar under these regulations. Um, and really, I, I welcome questions and, and comments here. There's a lot of specific instances uh, with regards to the referent is being used and the conants, which I do not feel like is necessary for this call. But if you do check out our website, we do go into detail about how the regulation affects new equipment versus existing equipment. Um, Jeremy, um, the, of course, the, the other main environmental concern in terms of selecting refrigerants, um, as I mentioned before, is um, talk kind of floating around about uh, global warming. And my other colleague here at EPA, Dave Godwin, is going to um, talk a little bit more about that environmental concern. Dave, go ahead. Thank you. Um, so right now EPA um, is primarily focused, or at least our group is primarily focused on out the ozone depleters. But we do know that as people sows out, one of the most common choices, certainly in the refrigeration world, are HFCs. And there, there's a lot of interest in HFCs um, because they are strong, potent greenhouse gases under of, uh, thousands times um, the potency of CO2. Uh, those HFC emissions are increasing, and people um, that in in the in the inventories that the U.S. puts out and that other countries put out. Most of those emis emissions are refrigerants. There are some other uses, for instance, as uh, propellants and uh, firefighting chemicals, but most refrigerants. And so, um, a lot of the, the um, on HFCs focus focuses on on um, refrigerant and air conditioning. Uh, some of you are probably aware that the EU has already issued mandates to phase out certain high GWPs. The most um, example is the HFC 134A that's used in mobile air conditioning and car air conditioners. Uh, the EU has called for that to be phased out. Um, and, and that prompted a lot of research, uh, some new tech 
carbon dioxide, which uh, has been a refrigerant that's been used in your industry as well. Also a new chemical, what, what's called a hydrofluorolefin, HFO. Uh, this, this chemical, although it's in HFC, has a pretty low uh, global warming potential on the order of four, as opposed to thousands. Uh, the congressional bills, um, and I'll list a few of them in the next slide, um, include HFCs. Uh, they recognize that it's a greenhouse gas, and they talk about controlling carbon dioxide. Uh, most of the bills also control other greenhouse gases, including HFCs. Um, everything recently, and certainly the, the last maybe four or five major bills that have come out, have actually taken HFCs um, out of the big basket with carbon dioxide. A separate uh, uh, control on HFCs, and all those bills have called for phase down, but not a complete phase out of HFCs. But uh, still a pretty significant cut in the amount of HFC HFCs that would be available in the future. Nationally, some countries, including the U.S., has proposed to amend the Montreal Protocol. Now, the Montreal Protocol was originally designed to set out all the ozone-depleting substances, uh, and that's a worldwide treaty with every single country um, agreeing to those controls. Uh, because HFCs are primarily a substitute for the ozone depleters, uh, people are looking at the Montreal Protocol these to be basically an implementing agency to fix down uh, HFC use and, and, of course, emissions. Two countries originally proposed an amendment uh, about a year ago, um, and in response to that amendment, the United States, Canada, and Mexico issued um, its own suggestions on how to, uh, how to propose that amendment. And uh, this will this was discussed at the last Montreal Protocol meeting, and um, is likely to be discussed even further at the upcoming meeting. You of course have um, supermarkets in California, and so you're probably familiar with uh, the California Air Resources Board and some of the controls that they've implemented on their own uh, to control climate change, and those are includes very specific uh, regulations and controls on HFCs uh, from supermarkets. REGI is the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative. That's basically the Northeast states. Uh, already started selling allowances for CO2 emissions from utility plants. Um, they don't directly control as, as a regional group HFCs. Uh, but several of the states I know are looking at HFCs and trying to understand uh, where those emissions are coming from and how they can control those as well. So these are a lot of things that are happening. Um, maybe not a direct effect on U.S. supermarkets right now, unless, again, you're in California. Uh, but they see uh, um, on the wall that things may be coming in the near future. Okay, thanks. Um, to just iterate some of the federal regulations that do exist on HFCs. First and foremost, um, for 15 years, you have not been allowed to vent HFCs. Uh, like the OES, when you're uh, servicing a refrigeration and air conditioning system, uh, whether it's a supermarket or a window air conditioner, you may not vent the refrigerator. Um, recently, um, last year, we the FDA published what we call the Mandatory Greenhouse Gas Reporting Rule. Now, this isn't going to apply to a lot of supermarkets, but it's um, more likely to apply to the large chemical manufacturers. Uh, they need to report their bulk production of HFCs, and if you're reporting, to report that import as well. 
Um, there is Rashi Told, and that's what this star means. Um, but the threshold for uh, for your industry can be passed pretty quickly. Uh, 1,500 pounds of the most popular refrigerant um, in your industry, R404A, would trigger that threshold. So if you're a supermarket and you're importing directly, if you're the importer of record, um, you would have to report. Now, most of you probably buy your refrigerant directly from a chemical company or a distributor, and um, they're the ones who may be importing the chemical, so they would have to report. Also expanding or proposing to expand that rule in the refrigeration and, and air conditioning world, uh, one important expansion that we have proposed is to require reporting not just of the chemical but the products that contain the chemical. So, for instance, today, um, window air conditioners um, are pre-charged with HC. Um, and as, if those are imported, then again, if you trigger that 25,000 metric ton threshold, then that importer would have to report that for our proposal. Now, we're taking comments on that proposal, um, so nothing's final yet. But um, again, something that we're looking at. Again, on the last slide, I mentioned some of the uh, climate bills that have been introduced in Congress. And here's a list of a few. There is, um, in 2007, Lieberman, Senators Lieberman and Warner proposed um, an energy climate bill that was, um, you know, it did by and amended by uh, Chairperson Boxer. Finley uh, in the House, Representatives uh, Waxman and Markey introduced a bill that actually passed the House um, in June of 2009. And uh, receptivity has been going on in the Senate. Uh, you probably have read the papers. Uh, Kay Lieberman and Graham had been working on a proposal. It's a little question now. Graham is um, Senator Graham from South Carolina has said he's um, kind of Said uh, the way things have gone, so nothing has been introduced by them. But um, depending on whom you listen to, that may still happen uh, later this year. Uh, all those bills that I mentioned, again, they all con contain control of HFCs. They all keep HFCs in their own little basket, so a utility looking to burn more coal couldn't buy up. AC emissions um, and trade for that. And again, they all called for a phase down, but not a complete phase out of HFCs. This is why you need to be concerned. And um, you know, some of the things that Green Chill is doing is are perfect responses to these kind of controls. Um, you know, they pass things like reducing the amount of HFC you use in a system and reducing the amount you leak and therefore need to replace in your supermarket. Great. Thanks. Um, thanks, Dave. Um, I'm going to uh, hand things over to um, Ron Vogel from Honeywell, and he's going to kick off. Um, he's the first of our chemical manufacturing partners to um, they're going to, I guess, kind of answer the question, you know, given those two environmental concerns, um, the R22 phase out and global warming concerns, um, you know, what what do they see in the future for refrigerants? What What is their company's response to those two global warming concerns? So, Ron, go ahead. Over to you. Thanks, Keely. Uh, my contact information is there, so anyone on the line, feel free to use that as well as our tech service line. In addition, my email address is ronald.vogel at honeywell.com. Uh, feel free to contact me by, by that method. Um, there are a lot of considerations a supermarket has to take into account uh, when selecting the best refrigerant for a particular application. Uh, we often discuss a lot of the physical factors uh, relating to performance and oil return, et cetera, 
increasingly uh, the environmental concerns uh, need to be considered as main considerations. Uh, Keely, Jeremy, and Dave pointed out uh, in 2010 and beyond, the two main environmental factors are the phase out of R22 uh, and the global warming concerns uh, related uh, to these products. Uh, to go uh, a little bit in depth on some of the other uh, factors, uh, I'll just start on our, our Adam slide here. On capacity, uh, when selecting refrigerant, there are, uh, obviously, if this is a retrofit situation, uh, you need to select a refrigerant that has a capacity of 22 uh, if there are some uh, system consequences. Uh, and I have some there. Uh, to the right efficiency, uh, it, it Tribute to uh, indirect if, if a refrigerant is not as efficient or nearly as efficient as, as R22 in a retrofit situation, uh, it can uh, uh, have consequences environmentally, and that includes all powered systems. And what we mean by that is uh, support equipment such as uh, power to drive, uh, cool towers, etc. Uh, flow is a uh, concern, a big concern in a retrofit. Uh, where you, you would need to select a refrigerant that has a mass flow close to R22. You don't uh, you just need to address some of the other uh, physical uh, parameters, uh, such as the expansion devices, uh, et cetera. Uh, if you fail to address some of these issues, uh, increased pressure drop uh, could impose penalties and, and hurt the overall efficiency. And touching environmental, the GWP, uh, based on uh, the pre-presenters, I think you can see that uh, uh, lower uh, GWP values going into the future um, are going to be important for a couple of reasons, not just environmental, but uh, uh, in the supermarkets, uh, uh, bottom line possibly with uh, the discussion around uh, GWP uh, taxation. Uh, uh, value to, in a retrofit situation, you may need to be concerned with. Uh, and refrigerants that, uh, again, meet the mass flow and have a pressure curve like R22 will guarantee uh, uh, reliable superheat uh, without possibly valve changes. Uh, return, uh, a lot of folks have different approaches to this. Most supermarkets have oil management systems in place, uh, but a full relationship, of course, will uh, guarantee uh, good oil return uh, to a compressor. Uh, our next uh, is on uh, a couple of different things, but the one is the introduction uh, of a new refrigerant that we re released, uh, uh, 407. Uh, Honeywell has been preparing uh, for these out of R22 uh, with a product like this, and we're continuing our R&D efforts, of course. Uh, I'll talk a little bit on this blend. It's uh, been submitted to a tray. It's an a It has an A1 safety rating. It's SNAP approved, patented by Honeywell. It's an HSC. It's a foreign uh, refrigerant, so there's a uh, glide similar to other 407 products. It is a uh, pure HFC, so it will also uh, require a POE lubricant. Um, interesting uh, feature of this refrigerant is uh, uh, we're very close to R22 in its GWP potential. Uh, so if you're retrofitting a R22 system, uh, you are not uh, greatly increasing the GWP as you would with some other selections. Uh, it's been formulated to mimic uh, R22 performance in, in built R22 systems, a good capacity match at medium and low, low temperature. We are not recommending this refrigerant for air conditioning as it uh, gives a little bit uh, too much capacity. Uh, discharge temperature is a little bit lower than R22. And uh, uh, the mass flow and the saturated uh, uh, pressure curve uh, allows the use of the existing R22 valves uh, in most cases without uh, an adjustment at all. Uh, by chart on, the, on this slide uh, just shows a curve. Uh, this is a low temperature uh, region, uh, minus 25 suction, 10 degrees of uh, superheat and cooling. Uh, and you can see this LT product uh, over various condensing temperatures tracks the um, uh, performance of R22. We could obviously supply uh, medium temp charts and whatever uh, uh, color, you know has in mind or, or their particular conditions. I thought interesting to take uh, on the top uh, right chart. A, uh, Sorry, to interrupt from just one more minute. Sure. Uh, the chart on the top uh, is basically built off the um, Green Chill theoretical study and looking at various uh, options that the supermarkets have uh, going forward. And, and interesting to note that if you use a, a with a GWP 
uh, around this LT product or 1800 or such, you, you gain a lot uh, uh, or real lot an environmental impact. In fact, if you draw a line across, you are approaching um, cascade systems and CO2 systems with substantially less um, uh, dollar outlay. So I thought that was an interesting uh, representation. And we're going to obviously give you more details if you're interested in uh, you know where we derive these numbers. And I'll, I'll oh. turn it over, Keely. Thank you. Okay. Thanks a lot, Ron. Um, sure. I'm going to hand over now to um, Stephen. Um, from Arkema, and uh, I think I have to go ahead and admit. There we go. All right. Thank you. Steve Scott, uh, Arkema. I'm Leslie from Arkema, and I just want to talk to you very quickly about some of the other alternatives out there today. Um, as I talked about before, the major issues that we're looking at is the reduction in the availability of R22 and also potential concerns about GWP going forward in the future. Uh, the mainstays of our industry are obviously 404A and 507A. They were developed as replacements or alternatives to 502 and 22. They're new applications, but they're also good retrofits for 502 and good retrofits for 22 systems. You can get good performance from these types of retrofits. However, uh, as we mentioned before, that they are high GWP refrigerants, and out of the available R22 retrofits on the market today, they are the highest at 904,000 respectively. They are also potentially expensive R22 retrofits. Both of these products have significantly higher head pressures and flow rate requirements than R22. And it typically means if you go this route with retrofits, you're changing out expansion devices, nozzles, possibly mindset and even condensers in some cases. There's a lot of uh, money wrapped up there in terms of both labor and parts. Sorry, can I just, before you move on, I, I, there's a, a hand, and um, if it has to do with uh, the understanding the, um, the I just want to give him an opportunity to, to ask a question for clarification. Um, Julius, did you want to ask a question? Yeah, uh, actually, I'll wait until you're done. Oh, okay. Sorry Thanks. about that, Steve. Go ahead. Okay, that's fine. Thank you. So there are alternatives to uh, 404A and 507A for equipment applications or for reference are available. Uh, the products that we're talking about today are I-407C or 407A or 27A. 407C and 407A are both well known in our industry and they're both used currently in both new and retrofit applications as alternatives to R22. The 407C is primarily in air conditioning or medium temp refrigerant. The 407A is primarily just refrigeration. While offering the R427A, which today is just a retrofit product, but it can be used in the air conditioning medium or low temp range. So if you're looking for one product to try and cover all your applications, you might want to consider that. All three of these refrigerants are lower GWP options to 404A or 507A, overall coming in at about 50% of the GWP. For specific applications, there are also overall good capacity matches to R22. 407C is one of the closest matches to R22 in air conditioning applications. And 407A is also a very good match to R22 in medium tab applications. Um, they also all have similar flow rates to R22, so changes to TXVs or nozzles or line sets are typically not required. They are HFC, so we do recommend POE oil for all these products. We have a lot of information on these products available at our website, and that's at www.4a-us.com. So if you're interested in talking about these products, we are available. Please let us know. And with that, I'll turn it back over to you, Keely. Okay. Thanks very much, Steve. Um, I'm going to hand things over now to Nick Strickland from DuPont. And uh, go ahead, Nick. Hey, I'm setting the bezel on my dive watch. I'm going to take exactly five minutes, no more or less. Let's try that out. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right, so my name's Nick Strickland. I'm the uh, market development manager for DuPont's refrigerants business. Um, du 
follows the legislation very closely, and we work very closely with the EPA. So I want to thank uh, everyone on the call and, and appreciate the opportunity to present today. Contact information is in the bottom left-hand corner, my email address and telephone number. Okay, so today we're going to talk about planning for the world's most popular refrigerant, R22. And I'm going to switch the slide here. So I want to talk a moment about um, the certainty that the final rule for the U.S. Clean Air Act provides for supermarkets. It's, it's actually a very good thing in terms of providing, you know, an outlook for the future supply situation. Until the final rule was signed, it was very up in the air. Nobody really understood what kind of allocations we were going to have to supply the U.S. market. Now, law being in place, we do understand what the supply-demand picture looks like. And uh, given that, DuPont continues to recommend that, um, that equipment owners take action now to plan for the aforementioned reduced supply of R22. Uh, business as usual is no longer an option. And we continue to recommend the five R's of refrigerant management, recordkeeping, repairing leaks, replacing old equipment with more energy-efficient equipment, recovery and reclaim, and retrofitting to HFCs as a to o, away from ozone depleting refrigerants as a way to use the R22 that's in your machines today as a corporate asset to service other equipment that has R22 to make the trans, to make a smooth transition away from uh, ozone depleting refrigerants. We're going to cover uh, new equipment down here. These are the products that DuPont manufactures and sells. Uh, we call these OEM refrigerants or original equipment manufacturing. 404A with the listed GWP for low temperature refrigeration, 407A for medium temperature refrigeration, which is the primary application, 407C for medium temperature refrigeration and air conditioning. I want to point to GWP of the global warming potential of 407C here is actually lower than R22. And I'll if anyone wants to ask a question about that, but I, I think that uh, if, if supermarkets, number one, Concern about global warming potential is global warming potential. Then you actually have an opportunity to lower it versus 22 by going with 407C. It's the lowest product on the market today. And then we have 410A for new equipment that has a higher global warming potential of 2088. There. So our website is uh, www.refrigerants.dupont.com. There at the bottom, uh, lots of resources, technical bulletins, and detailed information about these products for original equipment. Next slide is uh, refriger refrigerants for existing equipment. Uh, DuPont has invested in products that we <clears throat> that we market to replace R22 and R22 containing blends. These products are um, mineral oil compatible refrigerants, uh, and they market them under the Icyon trade name. And I've also listed the uh, trade name down here. So if you take the first uh, product, Icyon MO79 or 422A, it has a lower global warming potential than 404A and it's a 502 replacement, and its primary application is low temperature refrigeration. So I'll make the point again, any product today that contains R22 or R22 containing blends, there is a corresponding Icyon branded product that will replace those refrigerants. M29, which is a very popular refrigerant in Europe, is for low and medium temperature refrigeration, is an R22 replacement, again, a lower global warming potential than 404A. We have another product, MO49+, Plus, which is an R12 replacement, and ICON M09, which is for medium temperature primarily and for air conditioning. And we've also done low temperature systems as well with that product. Um, so that's kind of a broad product around different evaporator temperatures uh, if you want to go with one gas in the store. So next are, as a proof point to the performance of these products, uh, these products are approved by, for use in Copeland brand discus compressors. Uh, that's a good, strong proof point in the marketplace, and we're very proud of that, and we're very proud of our relationship well, with Copeland. Uh, these zero ozone depleting HFC refrigerant blends are SNAP approved for sale in the U.S. market and have a lower global, global warming potential than R404A. Uh, their ASHRAE classification is A1 non flammable, but well approved, and uh, standard filter dryers can be used with these products. Um, so, for more information, you can go to www.icon.com at the very bottom of the page there. Information around my contact information is also there, emails, technical. And there's contact information is there and phone numbers as well. And it's five minutes. So, Keely. Excellent. Thanks very much, Nick. Uh, I'm going to hand over now uh, to Scott Corper. 
Scott is from uh, Mexican Floor. Um, up until recently, uh, we called them Inio Floor. Um, Scott, go ahead. Uh, uh, hand I handed it over to you. Thanks, Kay. I appreciate it. Um, with me today also on the line is, is Sean Cunningham, our technical manager. I'm a product manager uh, for 4 a and want to give you guys kind of a glimpse of, of what we think is the best choice uh, for the future for refrigeration, both in retrofits and, and new systems. Let's start with retrofits. Uh, 4OSA is, is really what we've been promoting the last couple of years. Um, the great thing about this is not a, it's not a new refrigerant. It's been around since the 90s. Uh, it has a low GWP and it's uh, acceptable uh, for both medium and low temp uh, refrigeration. It was really designed as a 502 replacement. Uh, did gain traction in, in Europe and the U.S., but uh, essentially uh, kind of kind of phased out as the company at the time ICI was promoting it um, kind of moved away from from that segment. Um, but we reintroduced it back into the U.S. two years ago with, with great success. Uh, the product does require a uh, change of oil to POE. Uh, the traditional flush and fill method is acceptable. Um, most uh, contractors like to get it down to a 5% level of residual mineral oil. However, uh, some, some contractors are uh, just doing a one flush and, and uh, it's working quite well. Uh, 47A, will work with as much as a 50% mineral oil POE blend, uh, but we certainly like to see more POE in the system. Um, the uh, retrofit systems do not require uh, any equipment change or TXV replacement, which is very convenient. Uh, we find that uh, capacity and efficiency uh, is very, very similar to R22, and we have a number of case studies that supported our guideline documents, so those are available at the Green Show website if anybody wants to see any more of that information. We have a chart here where it shows performance of 407A versus T2. The, the four columns are, uh, you know, the evaporated condensing condition, um, evapocity, and discharge temp. And you can see that in, in all columns, um, uh, 407A does, does quite well compared to 22. Um, Basti, similar energy efficiency, lower discharge temperatures. We will now move on to uh, the new uh, equipment. Uh, it's touched on GWP, and, and it is it's a very important uh, topic and item when deciding what refrigerant to go to. And as you can see, 407A is a relatively low GWP product. Uh, especially if you compare it with 404A and 507. Um, in new systems, I believe we, uh, we do have energy efficient gain over 404A, both in low and medium temp. Uh, primarily, though, in medium temp applications. Um, it's more similar on low temps. Um, capacity is similar uh, as with 404A, but we also find um, it also depends on compressor type. Uh, We've seen some really good numbers out of scrolls and also some, uh, some two-stage compressors. Uh, but um, very, again, very similar to 404A. Um, we do require demand cooling on 407A, but it's at a reduced level as of what 22 would normally have been. Uh, we worked closely over the last few years um, and found that um, there are rack manufacturers out there now designing equipment for 407A, Hill Phoenix, Hussman, and Kaiser Warren are a few. We've also mostly with compressor manufacturers, and we have Copeland, Kyle, and Bitzer approval on a number of different types of compressors that are out in the field today and available. And of course, 407A is available uh, through multiple suppliers and distributors. That's that's all I have, Keely. Okay, thanks very much, Scott. Um, I'm going to hand things over now to uh, David Callender from i -Corps. Go ahead, David. Good evening, everyone. Again, my name is Dave Callender. This is my contact information. I'm a field technical support supervisor with i -Corps. Um You can see my phone number and 
address here if you need to contact me at a future date. Uh, what I would like to talk to you about this afternoon is our two products that we have available for grocery store application retrofits. One shot C product is our 422C. You can get A1, non toxic, non flammable, zero ODP, has a 3000 plus GWP, but in comparison to 404 and 507, has a higher critical temperature than some other replacements available. It shows its composition. Uh, one of the of these two refrigerants I'm showing today, uh, it does not require any oil change. These refrigerants work with all three of the refrigerant oils available in compressors, typically. And these are some of the This is mainly intended to replace 502 uh, low temp applications, uh, R22 low temp. And if it's being applied in an R22 low temp system, it will let your man cooling or injection not be used. So you will be increasing your energy consumption, lowering your energy consumption. And product is our R22 replacement. We uh, recommend this for air conditioning, refrigeration. Uh, we, we tend to stop around a minus 10 evaporator temperature. Uh, it's toxic, non-flammable also, has a lower GWP, higher critical temperature than most of its replacements. Um, and shows this composition here, what, it, what its blend is. And it gets, uh, can be used with uh, in any system with any oil. Uh, both systems, uh, the capacity with NU22B uh, typically is around 2 to 3% less than R22, and uh, which is really noticeable to any equipment used uh, to the user. Um, the the one-shot product, uh, you actually increase your capacity to where the equipment will not have to run as long. So, two products that ICOR has available. If you have any further questions, these these products have been out for a uh, little five years and being used in a variety of equipment of, out there, including grocery store uh, systems. And we've very good luck with it, and it's been working well. All I have. Really, thank okay. You. Thanks. Thanks very much, Dave. Um, I wanted to make sure too um, uh, uh, from, that everybody understands from Green Shield's perspective, um, of, and, and as a government agency, um, Green Shield and the EPA, um, we don't, um, you know, have anything to do with recommending um, any of these particular products, and and do we recommend um, a chemical refrigerant over a natural refrigerant? Um, our purpose, again, with this webinar today is um, to basically try to bring more to the forefront, you know, the two environmental concerns and, and some supermarkets' options in terms of um, how they might want to work together with chemical manufacturers to address those environmental concerns. Um, so, uh, I just want to be sure that that's clear. I actually... I I wanted to say that in the beginning, and I forgot to. So, um, Green Chill and EPA don't don't uh, endorse any of these products. Um, so, having said that, um, I'd like to open up uh, to the question and answer period. Um, let me actually, uh, uh, sorry, let me go back here and um, switch over to. Uh, Okay. Um, so, does anybody uh, want to start things off with a question? I'm sure that um, you you know you want to take advantage of the fact that we've got lots of experts on uh, commercial refrigerants here on the line. So, um, just looking for somebody to start off the questions. If, and if you do have one, again, click on that little button in the lower right hand corner with the hand. And, uh, and I'll see right away that you have a question. Um, Ray Saracino. Thank you. I wondered from any of the uh, manufacturers if there is uh, research efforts going on 
on currently to get us refrigerant products that uh, don't have a global warming potential or have global warming potentials that are much closer to, to CO2. This is Ron Vogel. If I could take a shot at it. Go Actually, ahead. Or I think Dave indicated the 1234YF uh, model that uh, is makes the performance of 134A. So uh, that's pretty much the first release of a product like that. And, and yes, R&D continues on high pressure refrigerants or possibly blends that would move the GWP number south. At least that's, yeah, that's from Honeywell's perspective. Is there, let me let me follow up on that. Um, there, I, I know the one two three four IF. Um, I, I'm I'm not familiar really in any detail with its refrigeration properties. Is is there any is is that something that might be applicable for commercial refrigeration later on in the future, either for retrofits or or new equipment? Well, uh, it's it'll have an A two or an A two L. Um, designation, that particular molecule, and as it mimics 134A, um, its volumetric efficiency is a little low, so you'd, you know, it would probably apply well to, say, screw compressors or centrifugals, but certainly if you were to look at uh, the height of a cascade system, medium temperature, uh, the molecule could find a place. Uh, Build codes, of course, would need to be massaged with an A2 or an A2L a refrigerant in a supermarket. You wouldn't you wouldn't be piping this, um, you know, through the store like you would a conventional DX. But uh, in a secondary system, sure, I th think it could find a place. Mm -hmm. how, how, can you, can you, how, uh, sorry, just to say, how, uh, Ron, how how far along, you know, would you say something like that might come? I mean, is that something people are working on that we might see in a you know a year or two, or is that a longer term project? Uh, some computer manufacturers have had. Had the this molecule and, and molecules like it for over a year, and, and yes, progress is being made uh, today. And it's really up to uh, uh, standards develop. Uh, Standard 15 and ASHRAE committee is now looking at that uh, A2L classification. When they're done, it will go on to um, the building code folks for adoption, and they'd be able to. You know, you'd have a set of rules basically to build a compressor room and handle a molecule like that. So it's all you know, it's all moving along in parallel along with the R and D effort. Great. Can I open it up to some of the other chemical manufacturers, um both to, to either respond to what Ron said or to respond to Ray's original question about work that's going on um on very low global warming potential refrigerants or or no global warming potential refrigerants. Yeah. Um, Keely, Sean, go ahead. Sean. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, just uh, just right on the on the line there. I'm not sure if everyone's familiar with ASHRAE ratings, but to mention the rating of two or a twelve is uh, flammable. So okay. the uh, the refrigerant would be flammable. That's why Ron was saying about the different codes. Okay. Yeah. Right. Sorry. Go ahead. Now the extra one with du DuPont, um, well, you know, the F gas regulation was passed and, and 12 to 4 YF is going to be first commercialized for automobiles in Europe starting in 2012. Uh, it, it, as a supermarket operator, if you could think about the, the uh, 1234 YF like you would think about 134A, so if you've got a, a market that's running with 134 in there, then and that would be a similar comparison to think of, although the global warming potential of 1230YF is 4 as compared to the, you know, 13, 1400. But think about it in that way in terms of capacity. Okay. Hey, it's Julius here. Um, yeah. Just wanted, wanted to answer not a question that's been raised here on 1234YF, but something that we do here quite a bit in the office, and that's that the, the compound is currently undergoing two reviews within EPA. Uh, it's being reviewed under the pre-manufacture notice as well as the, the SNAP acceptability uh, program. And for our office, which houses SNAP, we're currently looking at it for acceptability for use in motor vehicle, new motor vehicle air conditioners. So yet, we're not yet at the point, it sounds like the research and development may be a little ahead of where we are. We haven't received a submission for any other in-use. 
um, and PMN has not concluded their re review. Great to hear that that's going on. Okay. Great. Well, thank thanks for that. This is Conlin from our yeah, Patty. We have similar research um, projects underway, and we're looking at 1234YS and blends and other compounds and such. So okay. Marketplace yet. Uh, Colin Cunningham again with Mexican. Uh, probably no surprise that we too have R and D efforts going on, uh, for the duration application area. Well, I mean, it it sounds like you know, in in answer to Ray's question, um, it it sounds like you know the chemical manufacturers aren't just kind of you know sitting back and and you know it owns uh, you know all of you or most of you presented information on chemicals that have lower global warming potentials than, than kind of standards 404A and 507, um, global warming potentials either the same as R22 or a little bit higher, but it sounds like the manufacturers aren't just sitting back and saying, you know, that's good enough for us. It sounds like just about everybody is working on improvements um, above and beyond that, too, to get to the very, very low um, GW passes. So, uh, Ray, did that answer your question? Yes, did. Thank you, and that's that's encouraging to hear about. Great. Okay. Uh, anybody else uh, have a question? Somebody can muster up the courage out there. It's your skills around how to draw on the uh, on the on the thing. Here. <laughs> <laughs> I think that would be very interesting. I. <laughs> <laughs> um, Ray, did you did you have another question? I'm sorry, that's still my hand up from last time. That's okay. All right. Um, oh, good. So I I have a question here, um, uh, not from an individual, but evidently from the Air Resources Board. Yeah. Hi, Keely. This is Pamela at ARB. Hi, Pamela. Hey, I had a question. Uh, I think somebody, one of the presenters said something about banning HFC 134 in Europe. Uh, in I believe it's in the mobile sector only, or is it also in the stationary applications? Uh, the the F, European F-gas regulations require that automobiles, new model years starting in, uh, in 2012, will have uh, eliminate 134A. And we have our global marketing manager who handles that European account, Eric Youngdale. Eric, do you want to speak to that real quick? Uh, sure, Nick. Yeah, just to add a little clarification that actually, uh, typically as this is discussed, people talk about phasing out 134A, but if you actually read the relations, which is called the MAC directive under the EUF gas, it actually puts a cap of 150 GWP for any refrigerants used in mobile air conditioning. So uh, as a result, one is not allowed to be used, but it doesn't specifically call out 134 in terms as a refrigerant. Okay, Pamela, did that answer your question? I think so. So that, that means the stationary applications, if they use 134, they can still continue to use because of the mobile sector, the MAC. Uh, uh, that's correct. This is Eric. Okay. Yes, the MAC directive is specific for mobile air conditioning. Okay. There are no other directives at this time for other applications. Okay, thank you. Okay, great. thanks a lot. Um, any questions? From, uh, how about from any of the uh, supermarkets that are out there? Anybody want to, you know, uh, ask a question or, or maybe, you know, relay your experience um, in terms of what you've been thinking about related to global warming or the R22 phase out? These are a fantastic opportunity for um, our supermarkets to learn from each other. So it would be great if um, if somebody out there from the supermarkets come in. Tears. Well, the Greenville supermarket partners, I guess, are, are being very, very shy today. Maybe I have to say something incredibly provocative to get them all to yell at me. I don't know. Um, picture, picture, picture. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Uh, uh, 
Okay, well then I guess uh, last last chance for questions. I, I mean, if there aren't any questions, I don't want to hold everybody here on the phone um, begging for them. So um, if there aren't any, uh, hey, This is just yeah. I have a question. Um, manufacturers on, on the line speak to materials compatibility and, and what questions or, or who actually determines whether specifically oil compatibility is is, is a match with different We hear claims of compatibility, no oil change, no oil change required, oil change required. Some of the manufacturers speak to that. Sure. Um, who uh, who wants to start us off? Uh, uh, start off, Kylie. This is uh, Steve Lesser from Arkema. Okay. Um, I guess the the biggest thing that uh, I would say. On in regard to R22 retrofits, is that all of the retrofit options that I've seen are miscible with the additional mineral oil and apple benzene used in your 22 systems. That doesn't necessarily mean that uh, you can't use any of the retrofits with them, but there are issues with the miscibility that would have to be overcome. Um, Steve, can you just, um, for for some of the people who aren't as familiar with refrigerants and, and oils and things like that, can you just explain a little bit what um, immiscibility is? Sure. Um, well, think about uh, if you cook up a spaghetti and you throw some oil in the water, oil doesn't mix with the water. It floats on top once you shut the burner off. You can have the same type of behavior occur with HFC refrigerants, which 22 retrofits are based on, with metal and alpha benzene. So this can potentially lead to problems in your system uh, with oil return, oil being trapped out in the system, logging in the evaporator, and some other issues as well. Now there are uh, some refrigerants are more they have circulation with their traditional oils and others. There are manacle means that are used sometimes, such as the oil separators, to help overcome these issues. But, but all the 22 retrofits at the end of the day are immiscible with the mineral oil and apple benzene. Yeah, Haley, this is Nick. Uh, just to add to that, uh, the most expensive component, single component in, in, a, in a system is the compressor. And uh, the, the oil issue, or, Really, Julius, this is your question. The, the oil, it's going to impact the, the, a, a single component, call it the compressor. Really what that means is if the compressor companies are comfortable with the performance of the refrigerants in the compressors or in their systems using their compressors, that's, that's the biggest hurdle that, that needs to be overcome from a, from a you know, risk management standpoint. Um, Chuck, do you want to add that? Just piggyback, this is Chuck Olga with DuPont. The the issue is uh, uh, the oil in the compressor, and, and some nat oil naturally works its way out, so getting it back into the compressor where it's designed to do the lubrication job. Additionally, with CFCs, HFCs, mineral oil, they had good mutual uh, solubility, mutual miscibility, so you didn't really have an issue. And in general, the, the trend to HFCs uh, didn't have that miscibility, so the, the tends were to change to a polyol ester POE lubricant. Now, retrofit situations, there's some things you can do in some products that incorporate small amounts of hydrocarbon that help the oil return. So you can actually use predominantly HFC blends with mineral oil. But uh, there's a lot of testing been going on there looking at these issues. But the, the predominant issue is getting the oil return back to your compressor. There's a number of ways to do that in, in systems depending on the design and operating characteristics vary a little bit. But there's been a lot of stuff published out there in the past couple of years. So, uh, with with Julius' original question in terms of you know a, a, a couple of you had on your charts you know that you said you know this particular refrigerant is compatible with this particular oil, does that information come from the compressor manufacturers or or are those statements that were on your charts uh, is that does that information come from your own lab testing? You know, is there a body out there yeah. that kind of comes out and officially says, you know, uh, refrigerant X is compatible with this type of oil? Uh, it, it comes from both sources. Uh, the, the refrigerant manufacturers do a lot of their own, but 
the first say in a lot of cases is the compressor manufacturers, i.e., someone like Copeland, and they will have an official approval process where they will approve certain combinations of refrigerants and lubricants and, uh, and, and other compressor manufacturers. So it's in house from the manufacturers, but the, uh, the compressor manufacturers obviously have a, a vested interest in this area, so they uh, have their own approval process. Okay. Hey, Julie, hey, yeah. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. This is Gallander with Icor. Mm-hmm. Go ahead. I, I, yeah, both our refrigerants I, uh, on our sli the slides I presented, uh, both our refrigerants contain a hydrocarbon in its blend, in their blends, and we have not had any issues with oil return in any application that we've put our refrigerants in, uh, especially in grocery store uh like was mentioned before, most grocery store systems, rack systems, will have an oil separation device or mechanism to help oil separate and turn back to the compressors. So in respect to Julius's question, uh, as far as determines or what determines the oil return rate and all that, we have not had any issues with our refrigerant with mineral oil in the compressors. Okay. Okay, great. Thanks. Julius, did that, um, did that answer your question? So, I, I, yeah, somewhat. I, I was figure out as a user, if I'm in the view, taking the viewpoint of a user, where do I go to to buy claims of compatibility? It's an issue that's come up for years and years under our program. And just kind of put myself in, a, in the place of, of a potential user, I, I thought the answer to that question might be helpful. Well, I know, I know that um, we do address uh, that question, too, in the Green Shell Retrofit Guidelines, and I know that our recommendation is, you know, because the compressor is such an incredibly expensive piece of equipment, and, you know, and of course, above and beyond that, you know, you run into incredible problems if, if your compressors, you know, fail in your refrigeration system, right? So you don't want to be messing around with that. I know that we do recommend in the guidelines that um, on a store-by-store -store basis, you know, that you check with your compressor manufacturer, um, re especially related to issues like that. And my understanding is that the compressor manufacturers um, are, are ready, you know, willing and able um, to answer questions um, about specific stores, you know, related to to specific stores' individual compressors, um, and, and it seems with such a valuable piece of equipment, um, it seems like that that might be a good thing too. If if you're doing a retrofit, is um, you know, with your compressor manufacturer. That's certainly true, and especially because it impacts warranties and things of that nature. Yeah, I guess this is fun. Uh, I guess if I could add. Um, a lot of the oil return issues are system specific, and, and some of the other uh, presenters just mentioned that you know most rack systems have oil separators, et cetera. You know, all true. Uh, there are piping differences, and going to a retrofit, um, assumptions uh, about the piping and vertical lifts and the existence of P traps and all the good practices that that be in place on a on a on a good system. Uh, you know, you have to verify those. You know, if you go in with a non-miscible combination, a system that was designed for a miscible combination, and there are some sins that have been um, created uh, during remodels or even the original installation, that's where, you know, in a, say, a uh, mineral oil or an alkyl benzene with an HFC, you may see some problems. So, again, the only caution is, well, most of the time, you just need to pay uh, attention to the specifics uh, during the remodel and that kind of falls on the uh, you know the store owners to to verify the original uh, innovation you know criteria and, and proper piping practices etc just thought I'd mention you can have success in a, uh, a well line store uh, good oil separators good piping practices I fear sometimes is that the uh, contractor goes down the street and then he's working on a system that doesn't possess some of those uh, things and he's got uh, in 40 foot vertical lifts, it doesn't get sufficient oil return. We may have with a miscible combination. I just thought I would throw some of that out. That's a good. I agree. Yeah, I I I think um, I, I, you're absolutely right. I mean, it 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 you know 
relate to compressors and this type of thing, you know, and the amount of money that a supermarket spends on a retrofit, certainly better to be safe than sorry. Um, you all, I mean, bringing up service technicians is a, is a really, really good point. Um, you know, service technicians are so incredibly key um, in anything having to do with green chill, and, and you know, they they really, um, in terms of retrofits, um, you know, they're really key not only in, in getting out a retrofit um, in a way you know, meets your needs at a supermarket, but, but also in terms of supermarkets making clear to the service technician that's doing the retrofit that, that you want that person to stay and, and the retrofit is not complete until leak tightness of the system is, um, is assured. Um, so, you know, communication with the service technician and, and making sure you have a good service technician that has experience in this area is, uh, is really important. Anybody else? My name is Natalie, and I'm with the EPA here in um, Frankfort, Kentucky. Okay. Uh, two questions. This is for the market representatives in the crowd. Um, do you anticipate any challenges in meeting the EPA's um, 2020 goals, and if so, what? You mean the 2020 goals in terms of the R22 phase out? Yes. Okay. Um, uh, who wants to kick off? Or, oh, sorry. Who who wants to kick off an answer from the <laughs> chemical manufacturers? Any tears? <laughs> Keen, uh, come on. If no answers, is, is it, is it, is it yeah, challenging the question was directed. that goal? Um, is it really easy? What what exactly are we projecting? Are you, Natalie, are you asking the supermarkets, or are you asking when you said asking the market? I I assumed you meant the the uh, chemical manufacturers. Who who are you asking? I was actually asking asking the supermarket. Oh, okay. Sorry, I misunderstood. Okay. Now I know we have quite a few Green Shield partners on here, and I know uh, I've I've been uh, I've been with you at FMI conferences late at night. I know you're not shy people, and I know you don't. Uh, you, you don't fear talking in public, so um, and our supermarket partners want to just respond to whether you anticipate, uh, I guess, Natalie, you're referring to maybe supply problems with R22 coming up to 2020? Uh, yes. I say the general cost of the retrofits is going to be the only hindrance. Okay. Who, who, Chris with Col Chris Brown with Colburns. What cost difference is it looking at? Well, just the just the retrofit cost in itself, going from R22 to to the new refrigerants. Sure. If you just have a number of stores that have R22 in them, I mean, it's gonna I mean, it's add up in a hurry. Sure. What's the, I just I I know I had no idea what the you know what we were even talking in in terms of the cost of a retrofit and I asked somebody once of course the cost varies tremendously but just so people know um, I think the answer I received it's not we're not talking a couple thousand dollars we're we're actually talking often a cost that's over ten thousand dollars aren't we for a retrofit? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I I think I think at the time somebody told me if they had to, you know, give an average, they'd say fifteen thousand dollars per store. Okay. Okay. That's, way that's more than that, Kaylee. Way uh, more. Way that's way low. low. <laughs> you're talking fifteen uh, what? to twenty-five thousand dollars per rack, and if right. you put a store with per five, rack. yeah, you put five. Yeah. Yeah. Talking hundred to hundred twenty-five thousand dollars a store. Oh, I wasn't even aware that. That the person you know who said around fifteen to twenty, I I didn't know they meant per rack. I thought they were talking. Wow. Yeah. So you know, take a chain out there that has a thousand stores. Um, you know, you're you're not not talking pe certainly not not in any way, shape, or form talking peanuts. Jesus. Can you guys know me in on what a rack is? 
Sure. I'll take a shot at a big wolf. Uh, this is working very really well. Uh, a rack is a uh, series of compressors. Uh, it could be a number from, you know, two to whatever, six. And they are generally piped in what we call parallel. So uh, a rack is one of a refrigeration condensing unit holding the compressors and the receiver and the, the controls generally and oil management system. Uh, and if you were to look at one, it just looks like uh, four uh, car engines or five car engines sitting on a metal frame. And from there, it is uh, this refrigerant out to the store and up to the roof for condensing, et cetera. And it's, as I said, they're piped parallel generally uh, so that you can add or subtract the compressors that are running to account for the varying load. So it's a, a other than the system. Them, it's the advantage of ramping up and ramping down. I, I hope that description helps you. Yeah, it does. Um, I'm new to the EPA, and I'm curious as to how um, the information on these goals are going to get distributed um, across the market, so that all stores who need to, you know, come into compliance are going to be able to know um, one that they need to get in compliance, and then two how to go about it. So oh, in in terms of um, I mean we I I I'm not guess Jeremy and Dave are still on the <laughs> but I I'm I'm not I mean in terms of what we've talked about today um, mm-hmm. and coming into compliance I mean I'm I'm not sure that that's really we're thinking about that it's more um, you know vect of the R22 phase out. You know, and and restrictions as of January first, two thousand ten. Um, a supermarket is in compliance as long as they um, are not using R twenty two in new equipment, equipment produced after January first, two thousand ten. Um, you know, they are still allowed to use R twenty two to service existing equipment. So if a supermarket out there runs on R twenty two, you know, and they have a leak. Um, they they can use R22, you know, to refill their system. Uh, if they have, you know, general service and repairs, things like that, um, you know, they can continue to use R22. Um, the, uh, um, you know, but for a, a, a newly constructed store or if they're expanding an existing system, um, they, uh, they would not be able to use R22 for that. They would have to use um, some kind of an alternative. Okay. Um, so it's not, uh, you know, the, the the regulations are not forcing anyone to do retrofits, and they're not forcing anyone, or they're not saying that um, for existing stores you can't use R22. So okay. um, it's it's kind of a change of behavior, and and the reason that we are spending so much time talking about retrofits is that, um, you know, I said a retrofit, you know, according to Chill, I mean, we we don't look at it as a, as a retrofit as in and of itself as an environmental solution, mm-hmm. but um, for financial reasons, um, if supermarkets out there are expecting there to be a shortage of R22. Um, I think that that is a major motivator um, for them to um, to be converting R22 systems over to an alternative refrigerant. Okay. Um, and in terms of you know regulations and being in compliance during a retrofit, I think there you know the the major regulation that that comes in play is you know no venting of of refrigerants and you know making sure that when the retrofit is done. Um, that you know, your your system is leak tight, as leak tight as it can be. Mm-hmm. Anybody from EPA want to add? Hey, let me help her out to understand that there are different events uh, uh, with Green Chill members than there are with grocery store chains that aren't Green Chill members. Right? Um, that, that's absolutely right, and and I mean it. it that, that, that was. That might help her. That might help her understand instead of. Being in compliance, you're following 